Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 9462 in the name of Jackie Bailey on taking action on NHS waiting times. Uh, I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and to move the motion up to six minutes please Ms Bailey. Thank you presiding officer. There are 779,533 patients on waiting lists in Scotland. That's one in seven Scots, and it is the highest number of people waiting since records began. And this at the same time as there has been a 73% increase in the number of people going private because they cannot wait any longer. Despite this, in the warm words and promises of action, the number of people waiting is increasing. And when Hamza Youssef took over as Health Secretary, there were 603,000 people waiting for diagnosis or treatment. Now it's 175,000 higher. It touches every area, from failure to meet cancer waiting times targets, which we know has profound consequences on outcomes, to orthopaedics, where people are suffering in pain, waiting for literally years for treatment, to children waiting in distress for more than a year for an appointment with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. In response, Hamza Youssef sets targets for the longest waits to be treated, and we welcome that. Outpatient waits of more than two years would be eradicated, completely gone by August 2022. It hasn't happened. Inpatient waits of more than two years would also be eradicated by September 2022. It hasn't happened. And more than 18 months wait would be eradicated by December 2022 for outpatients. That also hasn't happened. One year waits for outpatients would be gone completely by March 2023. And you guessed it, presiding officer, that hasn't happened either. In fact, there are 31,498 patients still waiting. By every measure that the SNP government have set themselves, they have failed. And in fact, in England, with a population 10 times greater than Scotland, there are only 599 people waiting more than two years, whilst here, the figure is 7,849. That is 13 times higher. It is clear that the NHS recovery plan launched two years ago has simply not worked. Now, the consequences of this could not be more stark. Over 18,300 patients died on waiting lists last year. That's a 39% increase on deaths before the pandemic. And these are people for whom treatment could have saved or prolonged their lives. Whilst the SNP are fighting like ferrets in a sack, mired by their internal party scandals, Scotland's healthcare system plunges deeper into crisis. All of these numbers, no, I don't have time. All of these numbers are, of course, people whose lives are put on hold while they wait, often in pain, to get the medical care they need. People like 82-year-old Robert Stone, who has been waiting more than three years for a knee replacement. His daughter, Carol Murray, told me he's now lost all his dignity because of waiting so long. He's sleeping in a bed in his living room because he can't access his bedroom. He has become a prisoner in his own home. He is being treated like a dog waiting for scraps. Where is the fairness in this? Where is the humanity in this? I feel like I am slowly watching my father's demise before my eyes. He is one of the shocking 2,207 people waiting more than two years for orthopaedic surgery that Hamza Youssef pledged to end by September 2022. The creation of national treatment centres to get through the backlog, to streamline the approach to diagnostics, diagnostics and treatment was a welcome step. It is therefore hugely disappointing that many have been delayed and there is a funding shortfall and a lack of staffing. It took a freedom of information request from the Scottish Labour Party to get the details out of the SNP government. We now know that the government is unlikely to meet its commitment for national treatment centres to deliver an additional 40,000 inpatient and day case procedures in 25-26. And I quote, projections included in NHS recovery plan have dropped significantly. Plans for 1,500 additional staff by 2026 committed to in the NHS recovery plan is unlikely to be met with some boards already experiencing recruitment challenges in relation to staffing. 
A briefing to the Cabinet Secretary in March revealed that there was no revenue funding source for the National Treatment Centres not yet in construction. And to top it all, the remaining programme is not affordable on the basis of the current capital spending review. And in the update on national treatment centres in August last year, there were five centres that were classed as red, in danger of not being delivered until 2027, such as the limited progress being made. Will the Cabinet Secretary publish the revised schedule for national treatment centres and, whether, and will he confirm whether they will all proceed and by what timescale? Given that the NHS budget is reportedly overspent and capital projects are being cancelled, we need transparency and we need this information. Not content with crashing the health service, the SNP is now failing to deliver the modest recovery plan that it promised to implement. Waiting times are increasing, national treatment centres promised but not delivered, staffing targets not being met and ultimately patients being let down. Cabinet Secretary, we urgently need a new recovery plan. We need clinicians to lead this process. In orthopaedics, which is the single largest component of waiting lists, the clinicians and versus arthritis have been arguing for an orthopaedics recovery plan for years, but Hamza Youssef didn't listen to them. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit today to doing so now? SNP incompetence is threatening the very existence of our NHS. Michael Matheson must act now to support our valiant NHS staff and to undo the deadly legacy of his predecessor, Scotland's worst ever health minister, Hamza Youssef. I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to speak to and to move Amendment 9462.2 up to five minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. Then also, let me start by acknowledging the importance of this topic and welcome the opportunity to highlight the progress made by our NHS and equally the challenges that we continue to face. It is important to state from the outset that we remain focused on ensuring the health service recovers from the greatest challenge in its history. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our exceptional health and social care staff who are at the heart of our services. However, for many people accessing NHS and social care services, the experience is not what they or I would like it to be. There is work still to be done, and this is encapsulated in the published commitments both I and the First Minister have made. To achieve a series of tangible improvements in the health and social care system by 2026. These include reducing NHS waiting times year on year and delivering new national treatment centres. Invariably, pausing planned treatment during the pandemic has led to a build-up of numbers of people waiting. We must recognise that our health service has experienced unprecedented pressure, including pandemic backlogs, staff shortages and most difficult winter in the NHS's uh, history. I recognise that challenges remain, but I am committed to delivering sustained improvements year on year, reducing through service, including reductions through redesign and enhanced regional and national working. Even in the face of these challenges, we continue to see progress on reducing long waits following the introduction of the targets last year. We have seen a substantive reduction in new outpatient waits over two years since the target was announced last year, with 80 per cent of specialities having fewer than 10 waits over two years. And while 20 have none, our 18-month outpatient targets show the number waiting over 78 weeks reduced by 48.5 as of March this year compared to June last year, and our 12-month outpatient target shows 41 per cent of specialities have fewer than 10 patients waiting over 52 weeks. Waiting over two years for inpatients, daycare treatment have reduced, with the numbers waiting longer than two years reduced by some 27 per cent since the target was announced. I will give way to Jackie Bailey, because she was first, if you do not mind. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Um, he will, of course, realise that his predecessor set those targets to eradicate completely those waiting lists. He didn't say reduce them, he said eradicate them. And they were set as targets after the pandemic. 
Secretary. As I have outlined, we are making steady progress and we are seeing capacity increase within our NHS as well in order to help to make sure that we continue to reduce these waiting lists as we go forward. All of this work is further supported, of course, by our flagship National Treatment Centre programme. Four NTCs are opening this year, providing significant new and protected capacity for orthopaedics, ophthalmics and diagnostics. The new centres, including NTCs in Fife and Highlands, which opened in March and April this year, will provide eight orthopaedic theatres and inpatient day case wards, three orthopaedic room, sorry, endoscope rooms and two general theatres and eight orthopaedic theatres. Also, but I recognise that orthopaedics is one of the most challenging specialities, which is why I met last week with orthopaedic leads, where I asked them to support the development of a clear and specific plan for orthopaedics, considering capacity and what can be achieved in the way of further improvements. I want to see direct action in addressing the issue of orthopaedics that Jackie Bailey raised. Then, officer, this, the work we are taking forward also includes making sure that we invest in the recruitment and retention of our staff. NHS staff levels are historically high under this government, with nearly 23 per cent more in post than when we come into government. And only last week I announced that health boards have exceeded the target of recruiting an additional 750 registered nurses and allied health professionals from overseas, with 800 firm offers now in place. We will continue to do what we can to make sure that we make that long-term investment also in healthcare education, demonstrated by funding a record number of nursing and midwifery students this year. Also, in closing my remarks, I would like to reiterate my, my commitment to recovery and reform for a sustainable NHS moving forward, to focus on what can be done now and in the short term to maximise all capacity and resources to ensure that we see further improvements this year and into next year. As we build on the progress that we have made in the face of the challenges which we have as well, we will continue to maximise our capacity to recognise year-on-year -year reductions in those who have waited too long for their treatment in NHS Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Sandesh Gohani to speak to and move Amendment 9462.1 up to four minutes, Dr Gohani. Thank you. I wish to draw members to attention to my register of interest as a practising NHS GP. Our heroic NHS staff have been failed by the SNP's management of Scotland's NHS. The multitude of failures, the neglect, has resulted in prolonged suffering and deteriorating health for countless patients. The consequences of dereliction of duty are far-reaching and unacceptable. Over 800,000 Scots are on NHS waiting lists. Over 18,000 Scots died last year, died while waiting for treatment. Cancer waiting times in Scotland are the worst ever. And let's be clear, this is not down to COVID. The SNP last met their target over a decade ago. This is a betrayal of trust and a failure to deliver the quality healthcare patients deserve. It's simply unacceptable. Equally distressing are the record waiting times at A&E departments. Urgent action is needed to rectify this dire situation. But does the SNP Green Government act? No, it does not. The failure to meet waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services has left so many of our young people in jeopardy. Again, this is not COVID. The SNP have never met their target for 90% of children and young people to start treatment within 18 weeks. When Humza Yusuf was promoted to First Minister, 7,700 children were left waiting to start treatment. It's a disgrace. The Deputy First Minister also knows a thing or two about announcements and no delivery. When Shona Robeson was Health Secretary, she promised to end delayed discharge from hospital by the end of 2015, seven years on, and over 1,700 beds a day are occupied due to delayed discharge. Moreover, the SNP Greens cut to GP budget as well as health and social care spending, and this demonstrates a shocking lack of foresight and disregard for the well-being of the population. 65 million from the primary care budget cut, 
38 million from mental health care, cut. 70 million from social care, cut. Since the SNP promised in 2017 to increase the number of GPs by 800, GP numbers have actually decreased by 26. And yet this pledge was made time and time again by Humza Youssef and said in chamber and in the press that they are on target. The SNP has undermined the very foundations of our healthcare system, leaving it teetering on the brink of collapse. We now have an alarming number of vacancies for clinical staff. Over 6,000 nurses are missing. Plus, the Scottish Government is spending exorbitant amount on hiring agency staff. And take note, over the past decade, the SNP has shortchanged our NHS by over 17 billion and not fully passed on the Barnet consequentials to our health service. The SNP's management of Scotland's NHS is marred by record failure, and it is clear that we have, they have run out of ideas. We need a fresh approach that incorporates modern, efficient and local solutions in healthcare. In light of these pressing issues, we call on the Cabinet Secretary for Health to present a revised NHS recovery plan, one that includes the fact Humza Youssef knew in February projections for his flimsy recovery plan had dropped significantly. Scotland doesn't need a Cabinet Secretary who's just a continuity candidate. There is a palpable lack of accountability and a history of failure. We urge the Cabinet Secretary to deliver a credible plan, a fresh approach that prioritises the well-being of our people and ensures our healthcare system is properly supported. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Dr. Gohani. And I now call on Alex Go Hamilton. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. Go Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for securing time for this uh, important debate. I'd say I'd be happy to speak in it, but that would be a lie. I mean, here we are again. It's like beating your head against a brick wall. And the facts laid out in the motion for today's debate make grim reading indeed. We keep having to do this in opposition time because the government won't come to grips with the crisis they are presiding over. A staggering 779,000 patients awaiting treatment, 7,000 of them waiting for more than two years. A 73% increase in the number of Scots paying for private medical treatment. And the very worst statistic of all, over 18,000 patients died whilst waiting for treatment last year alone. 18,000, think about that for a second, presiding officer, because we're in the foothills of a public inquiry which will ascertain the, the root causes and the decisions that went into the deaths of 15,000 Scots in the entirety of the pandemic. 18,000, how many of them might be alive today were it not for the crisis currently engulfing our National Health Service? The stakes simply could not be higher. And I have lost count of the number of times we have had to debate this in opposition time in this chamber, whether they are forced to wait for hours for an ambulance, to be seen at A&E, or left abandoned on trolleys or languishing on wards, people are being let down. And I fear we have become accustomed to crisis, desensitised to it, and indeed tragedy in our health service. Presiding officer, it's simply not good enough, and we may have a new first minister, a new health secretary, but it's the same old, same old when it comes to ministerial disinterest and mismanagement. Did someone mention continuity? Because that feels like what we're getting. And presiding officer, I want to be crystal clear from the very outset, none of this is the fault of NHS staff. They have worked their socks off. They have worked for long hours, often under the most stressful conditions imaginable. And they deserve our utmost thanks. But they're being let down as well. There are currently over 7,000 NHS workforce vacancies left unfilled. And the chair of BMA Scotland, Dr Ian Kennedy, has said, and I quote, doctors and other healthcare workers are exhausted and facing burnout under increasing workloads. Now the government's failure to negotiate fair pay means junior doctors are set to strike, making things even more difficult. And when he was health secretary, Hamza Yusuf repeatedly rejected my party's calls for a staff burnout prevention strategy and a health and uh, social care staff assembly. How helpful that may have proved in allowing junior doctors to feel better supported and ensuring a conduit for their views to be heard. Instead, they feel they have no recourse now other than to industrial action. And let's remember, Humza Yusuf took great store in the leadership campaign and pointed to Scotland as the only place where NHS strikes were not happening. Well, they are happening now. And under this government's watch, costs for temporary staff rose to £567 million last year. 
It would seem that rather than making the meaningful investment in our health service that it needs, this government is relying on short-term fixes to plug the gaps. They are sticking plasters. Now, the SNP enjoy comparing Scotland to the rest of the UK when it suits them. Well, not so with NHS waiting times. Waits in Scotland are twice those south of the border. In England, around 10,000 patients have been waiting longer than 18 months for treatment. In Scotland, 21,000 have. It's no wonder, then, that so many people are turning to private medical treatment. They should be utterly embarrassed by that, the government. The competent management of our health service is perhaps the measure of a civilised society. It's what we elect our government to do first and foremost. What an indictment it is, then, that people are being forced to pay to get well. Let me say to this government and this health secretary, stop blaming the pandemic. It insults the intelligence and seriously tests the patience of both staff and patients. Instead, the government must now follow Scottish Liberal Democrats' advice, invest in our health service and give them the fair they pay they deserve. Adopt our burnout prevention strategy, set up that staff assembly so that doctors, nurses and junior trainees can feel heard and understood rather than ignored and unappreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. We will now move to the open debate. Backbench speeches of up to four minutes. I call Carol Mockin to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Ms. Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I appreciate the SNP have other things to be worried about this week, but Scottish Labour remains firmly focused on the priorities of Scottish people, and that is why today we debate the issues of increasing waiting lists impacting so many across the country. Labour required to bring this important debate to the Chamber as the current government tried to hide from the necessary business of the day. The government need to listen and they need to act. One in seven Scots find themselves on waiting lists today. One in seven. Many of them have been waiting for months, if not years. Many, like the countless constituents who have been contacting me, wait with insufferable pain and tragically many have died whilst waiting. The reality is, presiding officer, the Scottish Government can point to the pandemic as a global factor that caused unavoidable challenges. Predictably, the Cabinet Secretary did. Indeed, we do not disagree. We know the pand pandemic exacerbated issues with waiting lists. However, it is disingenuous and plainly incorrect to, to suggest this wasn't an issue before. And it is disingenuous and plainly wrong to say today we are making good project progress. I had been told to expect better from this Cabinet Secretary. Long waiting, list, long waiting lists do predate the pandemic. They are a result of governments avoiding difficult decisions, and in Scotland, this is in plain sight. They are a result of a government tired after 16 years, a government that has failed services, failed staff, and failed patients. Why to push its own agenda? Let me be clear, our NHS workforce are incredible. The service they continue to strive to provide daily is of the highest standard, but they are being let down, let down badly, and they deserve a lot better. Presiding officer, it is in debates such as this where I look, where we all look at the correspondence that we receive from constituents who feel helpless. They are in pain, they are suffering, they cannot live the life they want to live with their children, their friends, and their family. They feel guilty for being unable to do the things they used to be, be able to do because they sit on waiting lists and they have no indication of when their time will come. That is the unfortunate reality of SNP Scotland. Now, the SNP members at the back will not like to hear this, but they know this as well as we do. This is a reality. They receive correspondence from constituents. Now, do they scrutinise or do they accept the excuses? Do they push their front benches or do they clap to drown out the reality? They, they need to, they need to, uh, I'm not taking an intervention, thank you. People need to listen to this. They need to live with the decisions they make in that regard. Presiding officer, I, like others, was shocked and saddened to hear that over 18,000 people died on NHS waiting lists last year. And if the trend continues, it will be over 20,000 this year. This is tragic. However, if it does anything, it should tell the Cabinet Secretary and the Government that more of the same simply will not do. We need a plan for reducing waiting lists that support NHS staff by improving recruitment and retention, by opening up with urgency national treatment centres supported by highly skilled workforce and by delivering for patients through action, not making promises and failing to follow through. 
It has become clearer to people every day that this government is a government no stranger to a strategy, but a government that has a poor relationship with delivery, and this must change. In concluding, presiding officer, the challenges we face with waiting lists are 16 years in the making, worsened undoubtedly in recent years by existing problems. But despite this, the NHS workforce are lacking a funding and, and, and targeted investment plan. We are falling short to reduce waiting lists by, in this government. It is time that this government stepped up and provided a service to our NHS staff and patients. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms Moffin. I now call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Up to four minutes, please, uh, thank, you, presiding. thank you, presiding officer. And I welcome uh, this debate, and it's right that we look at the NHS. I do sometimes think when Labour bring these issues on health to the Chamber that they're living in a very much a political bubble and not what is happening on the ground. Because in my area of Cope Bridge and Chrysan, our local hospital is the Monklands Hospital. And the Labour Party, if they'd had their way, would have removed the A&E from the Monklands Hospital if it hadn't been for this government and the previous Health Secretary and previous First Minister Nicola Sturgeon reversing that decision. And there's never a mention of that. That would have been an absolutely <laughs> catastrophic blow for the area. Well, they're saying 16 years, 16 years, but that's, and I won't be taking any interventions because it's four minutes. You should have picked a longer time. And the key issue in this debate, presiding officer, is to address the NHS list, list in, in, waiting lists and workforce crisis. And that is an issue. And it's important to see that these issues have been discussed about, but we have to talk about it as the Cabinet Secretary in the context of the last few years. Yes, it's true that waiting lists are long for certain treatments, and we will all have constituents and personal contacts have experienced this. But it's also true that the pandemic brought the most challenging set of circumstances in our NHS's 75-year history. Not only, I, I can't, Monica, sorry, not only does this apply to the healthcare service here in Scotland, but Northern Ireland, Wales and England, and Labour. The Labour motion today is completely failing to acknowledge this, but that is the reality of the situation. We are not alone in this. It is true that the Scottish Government decides policy for the NHS, yes. It is true that the Scottish Government decides the funding for the NHS, yes. And it is also true that the Scottish Government funds the NHS to a higher level proportionally than other governments across the UK. And it is the Labour Party and their friends in the Tory party that do not like those facts. The SNP-led government's £1 billion NHS recovery plan has delivered a significant reduction in the number of two-year outpatient waits. The waiting time targets have already seen a substantial increase in the number of patients seen, with almost 56,000 inpatients or day cases and over 311,000 out, outpatients seen in the quarter to the end of December 2022, which are the highest number of patients seen since the onset of the COVID pandemic. And with regard to the staffing, once again, we must look at the issue in the wider context of these with the rest of the UK. When, since SNP first entered government, NHS staffing has increased by 22.7%. And recent research from the end of 22 shows that the NHS Scotland has higher staffing per head than NHS England. Scotland has also invested in the future sustainability of the NHS, with the NHS agenda for change staff being paid the best anywhere in the UK. And I do think there is an issue with bank staff. I think we will all hear that as... MSPs, and I think that is something that, that, that perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could reflect on in summing up, um, because a lot of staff are saying they, they, they can get better paid as bank staff. Finally, President Officer, the motion today also touches on the rise in patients having to pay for private care. And it's important to analyse this increase in a wider context. The rise in people paying for her private health care is not, again, unique to Scotland and affects health services right across the UK. We also have similar rates in self pay admissions, but at their highest or joint highest levels over the past four years in eight out of nine English regions. Now, the rise in patients across the UK having to use private health care is very concerning to me, and it's probably concerning for others as well. But unlike the Tories, and perhaps Labour as well, who may be happy for our NHS to be run by private providers, like in England, and Labour, whose private finance initiative policies caused the unprecedented damage to our NHS, as the Scottish Government continues to support principles, of a public service free at the point of use in need. No, I the member is about to conclude. Indeed, the Scottish Government has supported buyouts of hospital car parks in Glasgow and Dundee last year, as well as supporting the ending of PFI contract that outsourced a range of hospital support services at, for example, Wisher Hospital in my colleague Claire Adamson's constituency, bringing those services back in-house. To conclude, President Officer, the NHS in Scotland is facing grave challenges, 
However, this Scottish Government continues to fund and support our NHS with the limited powers we have. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr McGregor. And I now call, just in the act of doing it, Stephen Kerr to be followed by Mark Griffin. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Well, Fulda well, McGregor is trying to defend the indefensible. Well, what, can, what can be said in four minutes? Let, let me try by starting to say how let down patients, their families and NH work, NHS workers feel. We put a lot of trust in the NHS, our lives and the lives of our loved ones. But dedicated doctors and nurses feel the frustrations of a system that is too often failing patients, and they feel it acutely. We've got a health board in my constituency in special measures because of a failure of leadership, accountability and culture. Actually, the lack of accountability is startling. The board has launched a host of initiatives, but we are told as elected representatives that it's too soon to say if they're working. The special measures will probably last for more than a year. And I think my constituents are fully entitled to question how well the NHS works in their area. And they are entitled to explanations for huge waiting lists and missed targets. The more waiting lists increase, the more people who have paid their taxes and put their trust in the system are being let down. And we all know it's heartbreaking to listen to their stories. And it comes down to this, a lack of capacity in the system, which is a failure of leadership by this government. Because the fact is, many people in my constituency struggle to even get an appointment at their local health centre, because GP practices lists are full to bursting point. Now, I'm not saying any of this to criticise the brilliant people who work tirelessly in our NHS. For most of the NHS staff, their work is a vocation. They consistently go above and beyond, because if they didn't, the whole system would collapse. But they are being asked to do more and more. And as a result, they are seeing their mental health suffer. And we have record levels of spending in the NHS. Despite the fact the Scottish Government did not pass on £16 billion of Barnet consequentials that should have gone into the health service. But we also have record levels of vacancies and a crisis in recruitment and retention. Astonishing levels of vacancies in key roles. So what's gone wrong? In short, there has been a catastrophic failure of workforce planning. And that failure is the failure of SNP Scottish ministers and their lack of strategic planning. And they are in their 17th year in government. There can be no passing of the buck. And we have the problem of toxic workplace cultures in many places, including Forth Valley, meaning that critically important staff are leaving. Whistleblowers time and time again speak of bullying and intimidation. And all of this isn't happening just because of the pandemic. And nothing makes NHS workers more frustrated and angry than to hear ministers trot out those tired old lines. Because this goes a long way back further than the pandemic. It goes back to when Andrew Neil said to Nicola Sturgeon in an interview that the NHS in Scotland needed legislation to protect it from the SNP. What we are talking about in this debate is a colossal failure of government. The NHS is a complex organisation and bringing about changes akin to turning around a fleet of tankers. But management tick boxing has been prioritised by management over providing the service that patients expect and need. But to change culture, you need leadership. It starts at the top. Courage is needed to break that failed groupthink that currently exists in too many parts of Scotland's NHS. We need a culture which focuses on delivering the core purpose of the NHS, patient-centred care, free at the point of need. And for that to happen, I fear we need a new set of Scottish ministers who are open to that change that is badly needed. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Claire Adamson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, across the country, patients and staff are crying out for help to get the treatment they need and the support to do their job. It's what's overwhelming my inbox and office phone line, email after email, 
call after call from people who are in pain, who are unable to work, who are unable to go about their daily lives because they're on a waiting list with no end in sight. If that's what I'm getting, if that's what I'm hearing that Carol Mawkins is getting, that's what every single MSP in here will be getting. And yet, and yet the government come to the chamber dismissing those concerns. Instead, they continue to blame the pandemic for record waiting times, for delays to national treatment centres and an NHS workforce crisis. But over two years on from the 2021 election, back when Cumberland and Coastside were promised a new treatment centre that we were told would help clear the waiting lists, the government don't even mention it in their amendment today. In Cumberland, it will be June 2028 before the first patients are seen. And even that date is doubtful, not 2026, as was promised on those glossy election leaflets. That treatment centre was meant to help people on gynaecology, urology and ophthalmology waiting lists. Waiting lists that the Health Board said had increased 83% before COVID. And waiting lists in those speci specialities, which at the, the end of March, more than half had been waiting over 12 weeks for ophthalmology. Half of all gynaecology patients' waits are six months. A quarter of urology patients are waiting over a year. Under Hamza Yusuf, nothing was done to recover from the pandemic, and now we're left with the waiting lists that are the First Minister's legacy. This is his mess. These are his waiting lists. And FOIs that, that I've seen so show two years that have been simply wasted, damning internal documents that the whole, the whole centre meant for coming old into doubt. Report after report warning that NHS Lanarkshire is concerned about, and I quote, its inability to fund and recruit additional workforce. The Health Board is concerned about how it will attract staff to the town, and worse still, and quoting again, due to workforce restrictions, the Board may have to increase days of working per week. That's asking the burnt out NHS staff, who are already struggling, to increase their working week to cover for SNP government fields. That is entirely unacceptable. But the First Minister knows that. He knows that. He knows he wasted two years while those waiting lists spiralled. And when he gave his update on his NHS recovery plan in October, it scrubbed out the timescales for Cumberland's new local centre. And when the health, centre, the, the health board did the right thing and said that the open date should be pushed back to 2028, his government published its updates with no dates at all. An entire cover-up organisation um, of spin to deceive the people of Cumberland. That centre was meant to be worth £40 million in investment and over £12 million annually, but now it goes without a mention in any government documents. But he did so knowing full well that just two months before, officials had told him that those election commitments were at risk, and I quote, successful delivery appears to be unachievable, and the major issues, and I'm quoting again, do not appear to be manageable or resolvable. That was advice given to the First Minister. They've let down the community of Common Old, and today they've washed their hands of it in their amendment. Instead of talking about investment in the town, they've drawn, about, drawn on about England and Wales. President officer, the SNP want to be in power, but they never take responsibility. Patients and staff are fed up with endless excuses, the constant blaming of someone else for their ineptitude. Only the Labour Party will properly fund our NHS, ensure it's fighting fit, and deliver that treatment centre for coming old that is so desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm so disappointed this afternoon, and I'm disappointed because our health service has challenges. There is no doubt about that. But for the Labour Party to bring a debate to the Chamber this afternoon, completely ignoring the impact of the coronavirus and, and what that has done to our NHS, and also to come here attacking this government and completely failing to point out the inadequacies of the Westminster government, including the trussonomic budget that led to what Mark Drakeford described as taking a sledgehammer to the economy and public service. Both of these things have had an impact on the NHS in Scotland too. 
and we have big, big challenges to face. But some of the things that have been said about workforce planning and about um, people working, well, to Conservative colleagues and to Dr Glahani, the control of the pensions rules that have made it financially unattractive for retired um, uh, health service professionals to come back and support the health, health service, that's not in the control of this government. That's in the control of the NHS. No, I won't take any interventions. That's in the control of Westminster. Who uh, could members. Have that pension. They're quite ready to come forward with the Section 35 orders and things we want to do here. How about fixing the pension situation so that the retired doctors and doctors who will be willing to come back can do so at financial benefit? And what about the immigration uh, Dr. system? Dr Gohani, please, we need to listen to the member who has the floor. Excuse me, Dr Gohani, I said we need to listen to the member who has the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Ms Adamson, please continue. And what about the immigration si system, the hostile environment that makes it less attractive for people to come here? Brexit in itself has made people think twice about coming to the UK. But I've spoken already in this chamber, and I'll say it again about the plight of Sudanese health workers who have gone home or were in Sudan at the time of the conflict, unable to bring their families here, unable to come back into the country with an elderly relative and stuck in Egypt and Dubai. People that work for our health service who have been denied the opportunity to help their families at a terrible, terrible time of need. Where are the Tories on fixing that to make it more attractive for people to stay and be able to come and work here? That's a shocking indictment of what the, the um, UK government is doing in terms of immigration. And we wonder why we can't, we can't recruit people. I'm not going to take any interventions, sorry. It's a very short speech this afternoon, a very short time. I, I, Members, I, I've already said we need to listen to the member who has the floor. Thank you, Ms Adamson. Now, Labour, I understand their concerns. I think we all understand the concerns for the NHS. But it's simply not possible to ignore what their own ministers have said, what their own ministers, the concerns they've read, they, they have raised about, um, in, in, they're including the Welsh Health Secretary Morgan, who recently blamed chronic underfunding from the UK government for making the management of the Welsh NHS extremely difficult and called last winter the most difficult time in the history of the NHS. That is also felt in Scotland. That has also been the, con the conditions our own health workers have been working on. And I, I do think we need to work harder. And the Minister has said, and he's pointing out how hard he is working to ensure we still have the best paid health workers in this country, that we can protect things like free prescriptions, free eye tests, things that people value in Scotland. And it would be really nice if the Labour Party for once could put up a bit of criticism onto the UK government and their failure to support the NHS here and in Wales. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms Adamson. Uh, point of order, Stephen Kerr. Officer, uh, tell us whether there is a means by which it is possible to amend or correct the official record of this Parliament when a member has knowingly or unknowingly presented things in a speech that are factually incorrect, for example, in relation to pensions and doctors, or for, perhaps in relation to record levels of immigration to this country over the last two years? Uh, I thank Mr Kerr for his contribution. I think we're straying into debating points. And on the issue of correcting the record, I think Mr Kerr is well aware of the mechanism that currently exists uh, to that end. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Ros McCall. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin my contribution by express expressing my heartfelt thanks to everyone who works in our NHS. They've had an absolute mountain to climb since the outbreak of the pandemic and the fact that so many staff members are working so hard to keep us safe while facing this enormous challenge is incredible. There have also been huge impacts on patients, with too many people waiting too long for treatment due to the backlog of care that's been exacerbated by COVID. We have to get these weights down. That is undeniable. But while that work is done, and it's essential that people are supported while they wait, in the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, we have been hearing about Waiting Well initiatives being implemented by health boards, whereby patients are sent out letters when there are long waits. 
In NHS Fife, for example, staff engage in person-centred conversations with patients in all specialties to give them information about the expected waiting time, the reasons behind that, and to signpost them to other opportunities. This then keeps the lines of communication open and allows patients to keep in touch with the relevant consultant. NHS Fourth Valley, in my own region, has implemented assessment appointments to reduce waiting times. In July to September 2022, all patients on the adult psychological therapies waiting list were offered an assessment appointment with a clinician, which allowed patients to be matched to an appropriate intervention without unnecessary waits. This has reduced waits, but has also allowed the board to undertake, to undertake more effective service planning to better match type of demand to capacity. And I think we would all recognise this has relevance beyond the current period that we're in. Keeping in contact with patients on waiting lists and keeping them informed about how long they can reasonably expect to wait will help to reduce patient anxiety. And it's worth noting that boards are implementing new and innovative ways to do this. There is still much work to do, however, and I, as I know other members will be, am very concerned about staff wellbeing given the amount of pressure they're under. Staff had to shift from fighting COVID-19 during the worst periods of the pandemic to tackling the huge backlog that built up during lockdowns. And members have heard many times about the impact this has had on them. Staff are also being affected by workforce pressures as vacancies are a key barrier to reducing workload as well as waiting times. Recruitment efforts must clearly be prioritised, but so must retention, as we need to ensure the NHS has sufficient staff to tackle the backlog. Promoting staff wellbeing must play a key part of improving retention. In committee, we've also heard from health boards about how maintaining a focus on wellbeing has aided them in these efforts. During an evidence session, Robin McNaught, the Director of Finance and E-Health at the State Hospital Board for Scotland, spoke of the positive impact of peer support and induction on recruitment and retention of new staff. He described how there's been a focus on the development of a peer support network, both clinical and non-clinical, throughout the board. They've also delivered training sessions on peer support this year and now have a number of staff who are trained as peer support workers who can provide dedicated to support, support to new staff. At a later session, I asked representatives from NHS Fife, Grampian and Lothian if they'd considered setting up similar networks and they confirmed that they have rolled out peer support models across their organisations as well as wellbeing initiatives such as psychological first aid and speak up ambassadors. In his closing speech, I'd be interested to hear from the Cabinet Secretary how the government can support all health boards to roll out these peer support schemes if they're not already in place. I'd also be grateful for an update on the implementation of safe staffing legislation, as this will also help to reduce pressure on staff. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, we must not underestimate the challenge of working through the backlog of care. And while this is ongoing, we must be keenly aware of the extra pressure and stress it places on staff, patients and their loved ones, and do everything in our power to alleviate this. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Ros McCall to be followed by Claire Hockey. Up to four minutes, please, Ms McCall. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in this debate, as it's only the third time I've been able to contribute to a health motion. It is, however, disappointing to be already repeating myself regarding the pitiful record of this SNP Green government when it comes to Scotland's failing health service, especially regarding mental health provision for our children and young people. Many care-experienced children are likely to suffer from mental health issues, including ADHD, anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. And it's to this part of the Conservative Amendment that I want to draw the Chamber's attention and why it's imperative that we stop looking at these situations in isolation. Both my daughters have experience with aforementioned mental health issues. For most of their adolescence, they had to contend with extreme anxiety, manifesting itself in paralyzing fear and insomnia, difficulty in maintaining focus, control practices when it comes to food, and periods of debilitating depression and they are not alone in this capacity. Time and time again, we stand in this chamber and voice our collective will to the promise and regularly renew our commitment to changing lives for care-experienced children. But this is impossible if we do not recognise the connection to the mental health of our young people here in Scotland. Let's look at the statistics for Forth Valley in my region, especially CAMS waiting times. Nearly two-thirds of young people in Forth Valley who are struggling with their mental health are not being seen within the target time. 
Figures show NHS Forth Valley has missed a key child mental health waiting time target. Only 42 began treatment within 18 weeks between, sorry, 42% between January and March 2023, which is absolutely disgusting when you consider the target is 90%. Less than half of our local young people are being seen within the allocated time frame. Most shocking of all, half of the referrals for CAMS were rejected altogether in Forth Valley. That's 110 young people in a single month who find themselves without support. No one is creating these targets for the Scottish Government other than SNP ministers. It makes me wonder if the targets are based on any tangible analysis or simply plucked out of thin hair for a hashtag and a headline. Time and time again we are told of the work being done by this SNP Green Scottish Government to reduce waiting times. Nothing is happening. Increased spending per head of population is chanted out ad nauseum. But what are we actually seeing for this additional spend? A 10% extra spend should at least see a 10% increase in service provision, should it not? And whilst all this goes on, unfortunately, our young people with mental health issues have nothing to show for this headline-grabbing funding and are left living through mental and emotional hell. The final area I wish to highlight is on the pandemic and the consequences of locking down our young people. Our response to the pandemic has had a massive detrimental effect on our young people and we have barely begun to scratch the surface of the ongoing problems that we'll have on this generation. And if we're missing targets now, the situation is surely going to get worse. But the pandemic was a massive magnifying glass, scrutinising every one of our processes. Businesses and government alike all put under a microscope and analysed. It highlighted where society was working, just as much as it highlights where it wasn't. Presiding officer, if we only and blindly use this as an excuse to recovery delay, we are missing the opportunity to actually fix what was wrong in the first place. And we do a disservice to the people we serve, especially in this case for the ongoing mental health of Scotland's children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. I now call Claire Hockey, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government is determined to reduce waiting times across all health specialties. And within the past seven days alone, the Health Secretary announced funding for a new national digital dermatology programme, which could potentially reduce demand for outpatient dermatology appointments, which is one of the biggest outpatient specialties in Scotland, by up to 50%. In addition to this, on Monday, the First Minister opened Scotland's third national treatment centre in Inverness. The extra capacity created will help reduce NHS waiting lists that have built up during the pandemic. And the two further NTCs, which are set to open this year, will further help in this aim. As a result of actions like these, and while there is still more to do, there has been a continued reduction in long waits over 18 months, as well as a significant reduction in long waits over two years since targets were announced last July. Presiding officer, the Labour motion we have before us today shows us that they have their heads in the sand, and indeed how little they understand about the challenges faced by our NHS, not only in Scotland, but also across each of the UK nations. There is no recognition or acknowledgement of the biggest challenge that our NHS has ever faced in our almost 75 years' existence, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Scottish Labour may not wish to accept this fact from these benches, but they should listen to Welsh's Labour First, Labour First Minister, who recently said in a quote, the health services are trying to cope with the impact of the coronavirus and they are also trying to re-establish everything else that is important in those services. Quite evidently, health services across the four nations and indeed internationally are dealing with the effects of the pandemic on waiting times. President Officer, I also find it telling that Labour have referred to the use of private health care in their motion, which, although Labour would have you believe otherwise, is not unique in Scotland and affects health services right across the UK. The rate of people who are self-funding for private inpatient day case care is 19.9 per cent higher in England than it is in Scotland. And in Wales, where Labour have been in charge of the health service for around 25 years, 
the rate is an eye-watering 120% higher than in Scotland. Labour's own UK Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, was quoted recently as saying, Labour would use the spare capacity in the private sector to get patients seen faster. Another area where some self-reflection from Labour wouldn't go amiss is with regards to Brexit, which they now fully support, despite the impact it's having on recruiting and retaining NHS staff. And although NHS staff is up to historically high levels under this Scottish Government, we know that workers from overseas have long been an important part of our health and care workforce, and international recruitment is vital to addressing staffing shortages in the NHS. Since Brexit, the number of new international nurse registrants from inside the EU has fallen dramatically. Friends and colleagues have returned to their EU home country. Others have decided not to come to the UK who may have considered a new life here. And this is evidenced in the NMC registration data over the past few years. It's fact, not opinion. As a country, we need to find a way of ensuring we have an immigration system that is not just humane, but the also about to meets our social and economic needs. It is clear that Scotland will not find either of those things as part of the Westminster system of government. The route to both is through Scotland becoming an independent country. Challenges remain. And there are still unacceptable weights in some specialties, but the Scottish Government remains committed to delivering sustained improvement and year-on-year -year reduction through maximising capacity across Scotland, enhancing regional and national working and the redesign of services of care. Thank you, Ms Hockey. I now move to closing speeches. I call on Craig Hoy to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Hoy. Thank you, uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to say that uh, what the SNP lacked in number of contributions today, they made up uh, with inequality. Uh, but those were some of the most delusional and some of the worst speeches that I've heard since coming into this Parliament. And it's no surprise there were only four backbench uh, SNP MPs in this chamber when the Cabinet Secretary started. I don't know where they were. Perhaps they were down at the uh, florists, but they clearly were not uh, here. This uh, debate, I think, has exposed a shameful record uh, of the NHS under this government, where there are 7,000 unfilled vacancies in our health service. And since the beginning of this parliament, over 800,000 people have waited more than four hours at our overstretched a &E departments. In my own region, more and more patients are not being seen within the four-hour target at a &E, uh, rooms in the borders and in uh, Lothian. And that is more minister than ever before. As many as three in seven patients waited in accident emergency rooms in the borders in Lothian for longer than four hours at the start of the, this year. And that number is frankly unacceptable. In East Lothian, pressure on the NHS has been mounting due to the underfunding of uh, community treatment uh, and care services by the Scottish Government, leading to the closure or suspension of some of those vital services. At the Eddington Cottage uh, uh, Hospital in North Berwick, the minor injuries clinic is closed and the inpatient beds are removed, a monument to ministerial uh, inaction. And the arteries of our social care system are clogged to critical, and this is having an impact right across our NHS and in primary care. And on a daily basis, these capacity issues are leading to delays in discharging patients uh, from hospital, as Car uh, Carol Mockin said. In February alone, uh, 51,732 bed days were lost due to patients waiting uh, to be discharged. And this is an increase, a shocking increase, of 4,019 lost bed days compared to February uh, last year. So post-pandemic, Minister, the position is getting worse and delayed discharges have cost our NHS over £1.2 billion in the last decade of SNP rule, contributing to longer waiting times right throughout our NHS. And this is simply uh, not good enough, as Jackie Bailey has uh, said, and we are witnessing severe waiting times right across Scotland's health service. And perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary uh, rises to close, he might uh, take uh, the intervention I would have made had he taken it, which is to, for him to say sorry to our constituents, some of whom are elderly and frail and living in pain, but who are having to borrow money from their children or grandchildren for treatment that they deem to be essential, but which would not come quick enough. 
and we see some of the longest uh, waiting times in the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic arena, around an average wait of 63 days for outpatient uh, neurosurgery, 70 days for uh, respiratory medicine and oral surgery, and presiding officer, 98 days for neurology patients. Targets set, targets missed, all government credibility lost. And what do we get from this SNP government? A flimsy recovery plan, a flimsy document for a flimsy First Minister, a First Minister so flimsy he is not willing to stand up to his predecessor. Presiding officer, we should all be worried about uh, the NHS in the state it is in today under the uh, SNP. In concluding today's debate, I want to echo the calls of my colleagues in calling for better funding and support and urgent action. This is a government which has lost control of our NHS and social care system right across uh, Scotland. An incompetent SNP government, more worried now about search warrants than waiting times. A government which has mismanaged the NHS workforce. An SNP government which is forcing patients, young and old, to live in pain. A government which ultimately is now more focused on dividing our country than healing its people. Thank you, Mr Hoy. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to uh, close on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to four minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And my apologies because I'm not going to be able to, in the short time available to me, to respond to many of the points which have been raised uh, by members. But I'm sure that um, everyone in this chamber would recognise that uh, our NHS has gone through a major, major challenge over the course of the last few years. And I think it would be disingenuous to try to pretend otherwise. Uh, you know, for those who don't want to believe me that it's a major challenge, you only have to look at the uh, published report from Audit Scotland, which records it and recognises the significant challenge NHS Scotland is facing as a result of the challenges uh, during the pandemic and also uh, Brexit. You only have to look at the National Audit Office's report on NHS England, but it's again stating, and I quote, activity has continued to lag behind pre-pandemic levels and is well below planned trajectories with significant threats to its recovery. Or in Wales, where Audit Wales have said the same thing, saying the whole system change is overdue, the challenges which are in the system. So all parts of the NHS, if I can just make this point, first of all, Ms Bailey, and I'll give way, but all parts of our NHS are facing significant challenges. And it will take time to make sure that we're able to address that recovery, which is exactly what our NHS recovery plan is doing. And we can see that with the progress that it's making on waiting lists. I'll give way Jackie quickly Bailey. to Ms Bailey. And I indeed will be quick, presiding officer. Um, the recovery plan that, that your government produced was after the pandemic, after Brexit. Did you not take account of any of these things? And your recovery plan, frankly, is failing. We need to speak through the it, Chair, Cabinet Secretary. It, no, Deputy, Deputy President, Officer, it, it did take it into account, but these factors are all still impacting on our NHS, which is uh, an important point to be recognised. For example, Ms Bailey said that the targets that we set were to eradicate, were to eradicate the long waits. Actually, it was, a, it was across the majority of specialities, and we're seeing good progress being made on that. And then we had the, the brass neck, I must confess, on several occasions hearing from Tory benches, people talking about standing up for the founding principles of our NHS, where they are rapidly going through the process of privatising the NHS in England as quickly as they can yeah. in order to make sure they keep the fat cats and their back benches happy while they're taking money from private health care uh, companies. So it's a bit rich listening to anybody from the Conservative Party talking about the founding principles of the NHS, given it you abandoned them many, many years ago, and you're rapidly selling it off to your pals in the private sector as quickly as you can. Can I, can I say there were a number of important uh, excuse points Excuse me, Cabinet Secretary, please resume a, seat, a second, please. Um, I, I'm being kind of talked at from people, members, who are uh, remaining uh, in their sedentary position. That is not acceptable. If members have something to say, say it. If not, please let the member who has the floor continue to speak. Cabinet Secretary. So, no, sir, I want to pick up on a couple of issues that have been raised. And, and Jackie Bailey raised the issue of uh, orthopaedics. Um, I hope I haven't disappointed in her that I'm ahead of the game in this particular issue, having raised it today, given I've already started work on looking at how we can actually take further action around uh, orthopaedics. 
But equally, she also raised the issue, I think it was Mrs Murray's uh, um, uh, father, who presently is waiting. Uh, I don't know the details of the individual case, but if she wants to pass on the details of her individual case, um, I'd be more than happy to have that matter looked into as well. I can also say that um, uh, Gillian uh, uh, Mackay raised a really important point around the uh, safe staffing legislation. We are making steady progress with that. I had a good meeting with the RCN earlier this week, where we discussed the progress that we're making on the working groups that are taking forward some of the work around the guidance that will be associated with that for next year, and I hope that we will continue to make progress with that uh, going forward. So, and officer, I am very conscious of time, and drawing my remarks to a close, and I am sorry I have not been able to respond to many of the points that members have raised in the time available uh, to me. Some of them are worth more than others, I must say, to Mr Hoy. But I can also say uh, I will do everything I can as the Cabinet Secretary for Health to continue to support our NH staff in its recovery and to make sure we protect it. We protect it from those who would seek to undermine it, particularly on the Conservative benches, who have a track record of trying to undermine our NHS through privatisation and choking off its funding where it can. One thing the people of Scotland can be sure of is in this SNP government, we are completely committed to an NHS in the public sector's hands, delivering for the people of Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Paul Sweeney to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it is a pleasure to close this debate uh, on the Labour motion on our National Health Service and waiting times. The government seem oblivious to the fact that we are account holding the government to account on a matter which they have set for themselves, tests that they have set for themselves, which took place after Brexit and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And we do not dispute the fact that these are hugely challenging events, that they continue to exert an impact. But any credible plan would have accounted for that variability and that stress and would have taken countermeasures and actions accordingly. We have just not seen a dynamic or invigorating approach from the government to try and get on top of this, nor have we seen the degree of honesty that we should have from any responsible government. Because this isn't simply a abstract technocratic exercise here. This is something that we all have skin in the game with. One in seven Scots. These are our neighbours, our family members, our friends. It could be one of us who are at the mercy of a system which is in serious distress. And that is why it is so essential that this motion was brought to this chamber today for debate, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I hope, or I had hoped that members from the government benches would have treated it with that degree of seriousness. And I've been very disappointed at the tone adopted in that respect because we are bringing this with a spirit of collegiality and in a spirit of trying to come together to resolve a common challenge facing our country and facing one of the most precious institutions uh, that our country has ever built. And it's simply the fact that Public Health Scotland data has shown that 31,498 patients were still waiting over one year for an outpatient appointment. That is totally unacceptable, completely unacceptable. And we have heard already from colleagues that 18,000 of our fellow citizens have perished waiting on treatment. This is a scandal and it cannot be treated with the glibness that has been in this chamber today. Many members have referred to structural and systemic issues facing our National Health Service. I think the um, Tory member for Glasgow, Mr Kulhani, uh, mentioned that there is an issue with delayed discharge and patient flow is critical to achieving efficient systems. That is a, a fair observation and it is something that the government needs to understand greater because it's simply maintaining the status quo is not a neutral option because people are paying the price of that. We have seen that data shows 6,895 people face a wait of over two years for routine surgery. Two years in agony, two years disabled, two years unable to contribute or care for their relatives. It's just not acceptable and it casts a very dark shadow over our country. That impacts on all sorts of things, our economic capacity and it introduces lifelong costs that end up being a false economy as people face lifelong disabilities. The member for Cope Bridge and Christon referred to A&E departments. I mean, it was a red herring. I mean, this is stuff that took place when I was still at school. The reality is this government has been in power my entire adult life, and it's about time that they took uh, responsibility for their own actions in government. It's simply not acceptable for this continued nonsense about things that took place a generation ago, because the reality is these are decisions that were taken 
on this government's watch, and they should have the honesty intellectually and morally to take uh, responsibility for it. Happy to give away to my friend. Yeah. Uh, Monica Lennon. So, if Mr McGregor had taken intervention, what I wanted to say is that this is not about the political bubble. I've been speaking to young people from Lanarkshire this week, who are young people from Ukraine, who are here seeking sanctuary, and have said to me that it's easier and quicker to get healthcare to travel back to Ukraine than it is in Lanarkshire or central Scotland. That's the reality that we're facing. So, what does my colleague say to that? Because I think the well, people in Scotland expect I, I us to, to have to very Thank strong you, responses. Paul Sweeney, please continue. It's, it's absolutely um, critical. I mean, these are cases that we're hearing, and many members, every member in this chamber, will have received correspondence of that kind, whether it is from new Scots or people who have lived here their entire lives. Indeed, one constituent of mine was unable to work until he'd received a series of tests on his heart and was out of work for almost a year while he waited on an appointment. Upon chasing this up for him, it transpired that his referral was never made. Shocking. And it was mentioned by Ms Mackay, the Green Member for Central Scotland, that waiting well initiatives are taking place. We commend those. We encourage those. I think the committee has heard great evidence on that. But the reality is they clearly aren't working. And in every instance where they are failing, that Cabinet Secretary must have that report on his desk and understand the root cause of exactly what went wrong and ensure that resilient measures are put in place to correct it. We've had many other cases. When our constituent of mine was told she needed knee surgery in 2020 well, and then Mr. was told Sweeney, in 2022 to to close, that she might need to wait another two years for treatment. Orthopaedic recovery plan commended, but it's clearly pointing to a wider policy of failure. So in reality, whilst we recognise the government are facing challenges, we are holding them to account on their own tests set according to the constraints that they have already identified. It's not an excuse. They need to get to grips with this crisis engulfing our National Health Service or we risk losing it forever. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. And that concludes the debate on taking action on NHS waiting times. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.